really excited today. So we have Kendra Keenan as the global marketing manager. By the way, a new position for her. She was assistant, now she's global. Congrats, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, for Potatoes USA. Uh, and then RJ Harvey is the director of culinary uh, for Potatoes USA. Of course, everybody here knows him. <laughs> and has been following you for the entire last year. Uh, thanks for keeping us excited and uh, enthused about new things that you're cooking. Uh, Shane Shively will be with us soon. He has, is in a meeting. He's opening a new uh, prototype at, at Opens this weekend. So he's going to be on, on with us in about 20 minutes. And he's a corporate chef and director of culinary operations for First Watch restaurants. Uh, if you don't know First Watch, they're based out of Florida. Uh, but then they bought Egg and I out of uh, Denver, Colorado, which expanded them throughout the West. And now they went from, he was originally on our board for GCI. And of course, now they're way into the top 200. I think they're somewhere around, you know, like 125 or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it is, but they're a great company with a lot of fresh ingredients. And so you'll hear from him about what they're doing and their new menu that they're going to have. And Maria Moli, we have this client solution specialist for Data Essential. So we're happy she's been with us many times in the past at both live events and, you know, and, and on one of our other webinars as well. So we're real happy to have you here. So we're gonna get started. Um, and what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna start out, Kendra is gonna come on first and do a little presentation for us, uh, followed by RJ doing a demo. Uh, you guys are on and I'll be you know, live here as well. We'll ask some questions. If anybody has questions, you can either put it you know, into the chat, but if you do chat, make sure you say to all, don't just do it to the panel. Um, and then also there's a Q and A that you can put or you can raise your hand. If you do that, we have Megan in the office who's monitoring that. And also the GCI screen you can see is Mike Spelt. So Mike is here to help run videos and audio and do all that. But thanks everyone for being on. Look forward to, uh, to a great webinar. And uh, Kendra, you're on. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to start off. I mean, Kevin already introduced both of us. And as you um, know, RJ, but for a lot of you I haven't met personally, um, been with Potatoes for a little over two years now. And I oversee the food service program, both in the US and internationally. And so we work really to just get more potatoes across the world on uh, more restaurant menus. And so I'm excited to share today and then also introduce myself and um, share all we got about potatoes. So I'll go ahead and jump into the trending potato dishes. And a lot of different uh, key hot topics to talk about. And the first one that we've seen are, have been American, Asian American mashups. And um, I mean, Asian food has been synonymous with delivery and has really been just a, a powerhouse with um, takeout um, eat for decades, even before the pandemic. And so ways to combine America's favorite vegetable, potatoes, um, in a way that's comfort food, but also flavors to kind of um, drive consumers back. So we have something like general salads, potatoes, a little bit of spice to them. That can be served nicely. We've kind of featured these initially as like an air fryer recipe, but these can be featured with a nice crunch with some sauce with it. And then we also have beef and broccoli fries, which are kind of just the perfect mix up between a um, classic dish and um, potatoes. And actually, uh, so Flavor in the Menu had put on their top 2021 trends, Chinese American mashups. So these are just some fun ways to include uh, potatoes with something like Chinese cuisine. Uh, so of course, throughout um, just the pandemic and years, uh, year after year, fries reign supreme. We know uh, Grubhub in their top uh, 2020 recap, uh, fries were the top side dish and year after year, they're America's favorite side dish. Um, but we have loaded fries that have grown 54% on menus over the past four years, and then loaded tots, 163%. So a lot of loaded options with different flavors that on top. So in, in some examples that we have here are like Jamaican jerk loaded fries, Baja shrimp, and Alpa store with a little bit of Caribbean, Latin American uh, theme to them. But the generation that these have resonated with most have been millennials and Gen X. And so obviously a lot of fun ways that can keep craveable fries that you can't really replicate at home, but have at restaurants available. And of course, um, the main theme of the webinar, which is breakfast all day, every day. So although breakfast has kind of downtrend uh, during the pandemic with lack of commuters going out, we know it's gonna be making a comeback and it doesn't have to be eaten in the morning. It can be for lunch, it can be for dinner. Um, and to, we actually have information from National Restaurant Association um, that says that breakfast menu items are still in the top seven 
top sellers at all restaurants. This can be from full service to limited service. So here are a couple different ways. We have a breakfast gnocchi that can be made with either fresh or dehydrated or even different frozen mashes. A uh, Korean eggs Benedict. So instead of the um, toast you can put, or muffin, you can put uh, potatoes at the bottom, of course. And then what RJ will be featuring a little bit later, something what we've termed as spudwich. Some of you have, may have seen this uh, feature before, but it's basically just the two hash brown patties, great gluten-free option, but ways that um, we can feature breakfast. And breakfast items are still gonna remain a core piece of what consumers are gonna want um, coming into the year. And of course, we wanna do a little feature and shout out. We know First Watch is gonna be on a little bit later, but shout out to Chef Shane um, with their Hacienda hash that they serve. Um, it's just one way that you can include potatoes as a base with lots of different ingredients. They work with a lot of different flavors and kind of works into what our next point is, which is working with different types of bowls. Um, bowls are many different ways you can call them. You can add different ingredients, but um, one area that we're looking at is healthy bowls. Um, they're on the rise according to NRA, and they've grown on menus over 35% and up to 20% over the past four years. Um, a lot of different versatile ways. You can do everything from hash brown for breakfast or using um, um, something like a, what we call Casablanca potato bowl. So it's using Moroccan flavors like harissa um, to combine them all together. And this is definitely what we're gonna be featuring today because they're portable, which is great for takeout and delivery. And I'm gonna do one more quick shout out to uh, Chef Farley with Wawa, who we know has been um, adding a lot of different bowls to the menu, including their spicy pepper brisket on a mashed potato. And so I know we've, uh, we'll have we be featuring mashed potatoes um, in just a little bit. And so an exciting way to kind of have um, potatoes be featured as a base and used. And that kind of concludes all kind of what's hot and what's going right now. And then RJ will talk to a little more of these points during his culinary demonstration. And it should be very exciting. All right. All right, so we'll have RJ take it away. This is a great opportunity for us, the sponsors, to really engage with the members and showcase some cool innovation since we all can't come together uh, in person. So, you know, Kendra touched a lot on all of the trends that we have been really focusing on um, in, in the past year, right? Um, we know for a fact that, that delivery and takeout has obviously exploded for, for good reason, right? And so when we're looking at different types of potato dishes, we're trying to brainstorm ways that that can still be delivered to the end user, your customers uh, at top-notch quality. So today we're gonna do a couple different demonstrations. The first one I wanna talk about isn't really so much of a demonstration as it is ideation. So, you know, everybody in the audience is getting more and more requests for gluten-free foods. Here what we have is we have what we've called the spud witch. And it's basically just transforming frozen hash brown patties in lieu of the bread for any type of sandwich. Here we have a, a Rachel and a Reuben kind of combined together. So we've got pastrami and we've got corned beef along with a really zesty coleslaw, some Thousand Island and some sauerkraut. Um, so it's a pretty robust sandwich, but what's great about it is you get this really nice crunch from the hash brown patty. And so think about this in all different ways that you can add this to your menu, right? It doesn't have to be pastrami. It doesn't have to be corned beef. You can do an awesome BLT like this. Uh, you can top this up with roasted roast beef, uh, a little bit of caramelized onions, a really nice whole grain mustard. So utilizing different cuts that you may have seen in the past is a great way for you to expand your menu offerings, but also introduce something that your guests are probably asking for. So a gluten-free solution, for bread or toast, um, you know, frozen hash brown patties are really the way to go. We talk a lot about uh, all the different types of frozen potato products that are out there, right? I mean, you guys have all experienced them. We've got tots and we've got waffle fries and wedge cuts and all sorts of different things. Um, but the other side 
side of processed potatoes is dehydrated potatoes. So you'll hear us refer to dehydrated potatoes quite a bit. And this has been like a miracle ingredient um, for me. I've noticed that it just has so many different applications. So we're going to do a little bit of potato myth busting, if you will, surrounding dehydrated potatoes, because they kind of get a bad flack amongst a, a chef audience, if you will. So potato is about 80% water, right? So if we remove most of that water, what we're able to do is extend the shelf life, but we're also able to uh, recreate mashed potatoes in a very quick fashion. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do that here uh, in, in a moment. But dehydrated potato flakes are not just for mashed potatoes. They make a great gluten-free breading. So if you're doing croquettes or you're breading a piece of fish, uh, reach for some dehydrated potato flakes. They add nice crunch. They get really nice color. But again, they're also gluten-free. Um, in addition to using them as a breading or a coating, you can also use them as a filler, a binder uh, for stuffings, for sausages, for uh, meatballs. They really do trap a lot of moisture. And so that gives you a really moist end product, which is really nice. Um, the dish that we're going to be doing for you all is uh, a play on steak and potatoes, but it's got a Korean spin to it. So we're actually going to be making some bulgogi beef. And we're going to top that on some miso whipped mashed potatoes using the dehydrated potato flakes. Now, I know a lot of chefs are saying, well, why would I want to reach for dehy if I get really good potatoes in my operation? Well, there's a couple reasons why you may want to opt for dehydrated potatoes as opposed to fresh potatoes. We're all dealing with reduced labor right now, right? So uh, dehydrated potatoes are great if you have a reduced labor force. Um, there's 100% yield with dehydrated potatoes. And if you think about all the steps that it takes a cook to cut up potatoes, put them into boiling water, get them, get them cooking, drain all that boiling water off of them, mash them, there's a lot of steps involved. When you're using a dehydrated product, it comes together very quickly and very rapidly. So what I've got here in this, in this little bowl is I've got uh, some beef tenderloin and some, just some odds and ends of some really tender steak. And what I've got this marinating in is a little bit of pureed Asian pear. Uh, there's a little bit of pureed onion, some ginger, uh, some garlic, along with uh, soy sauce, brown sugar, uh, and a little bit of gochujang, uh, just for a little added spice. Um, and then, of course, we've got some onions, we've got some green, uh, green onions, and some uh, carrots all in here. So we're just going to cook this off and let that beef get nice and tender. And while we're doing that, I'm going to show you how easy it is to whip up some really delicious mashed potatoes. So what you want to do for dehydrated mashed potatoes is you want to take some hot water. Um, it's, it doesn't have to be boiling hot, um, but you do want to get it above 190. So we're going to add that. We're going to also add in a little bit of butter into that hot water, and that hot water will start to melt that butter. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add in some milk, and this milk uh, needs to be cold. What happens is, is the milk brings down the temperature of that hot water so that when we add our dehydrated potato flakes, uh, they don't become gluey. That starch doesn't get overly activated. We're going to add in a little bit of salt, and now we're going to add in our dehydrated potato flakes. All at once, just go ahead and give it a whisk. And they need to rehydrate slightly. So after I whisk them for about uh, 30 seconds or so, I let them sit for another minute, minute and a half. And what happens is, is they starting to tighten up a little bit and you'll see that those flakes will start to absorb. And then that is the perfect time to go ahead and add in our miso. Now you can add in all sorts of different things to these uh, dehydrated potatoes to get them a little bit more flavor. Um, but miso is really, really lovely with potatoes. It adds a lot of umami, which potatoes don't naturally have, um, but it also adds a nice salinity to it. And I think it pairs really lovely with our um, bulgogi beef. So we'll just give that a quick little whisk.
And then we're gonna just go ahead and put that into a piping bag. I'll go ahead and give him a beef a stir. So some other potato myths that are out there is that uh, dehydrated potatoes don't have the same nutrition as uh, fresh potatoes. And they absolutely do. The only one nutrient that's probably lacking a little bit in dehydrated potatoes is vitamin C. And that's because vitamin C is a heat soluble vitamin. So anytime you heat up something with vitamin C, you're going to be reducing the effectiveness of that vitamin C in that item. So our miso whipped potatoes go into this uh, pastry bag. You don't have to do this. This, of course, is uh, just for added flex. But you guys know me, and I always have to flex hard. So we're going to go ahead and put this into our little pastry bag, keeping most of it in the bag. RJ, you're doing a great job, man. That's great. Thank you uh, so much for, you know, especially the insights on the vitamin C. I didn't really know that. Yeah, absolutely. So now what we've got here is just got our bowl and we're ready for plate up, right? So we're gonna go ahead and pipe a nice little platform of our mashed potatoes down. And think about this for takeout and delivery, right? You can flavor these mashed potatoes with anything. If you've got some pesto on your line, add some of that in there instead of the miso, right? If you have some Calabrian chilies, throw that in there and then you can top it with all sorts of really cool uh, 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 Italian toppings, like some really lovely meatballs would be lovely on top of that, right? So our bulgogi is just about done. One thing I've learned with this dish is uh, obviously don't overcook the beef. That's pretty key. And those are just gonna go right on top of our mashed potatoes. Try and get some of those veggies in there too. And then um, I always like to add just a little kimchi to this. I think it gives it a nice contrast and flavor. It also gives you some probiotics that you can uh, Introduce to your to your healthy gut. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a uh, kimchi on top there, and of course you can make your own kimchi, but uh, store bought is fine too. And then we're just gonna garnish this with a few different things, right? We've got some uh, some green onion here. Got some shredded carrot. Some lovely pea shoots. I love the color as always, RJ. You're so awesome at this. Well, thank you, sir. I try, you know, I believe we eat with our eyes first, uh, as most of the audience here can attest to. But here's what we have. We have our uh, miso whipped potatoes with our Korean bulgogi beef. So just a fun play on steak and potatoes. Again, introducing global flavors, potatoes as the base. You know, when we're talking about plant forward or plant based cuisine, you know, you could swap, you could swap out anything for this beef, right? Um, but the idea is that we're introducing more vegetables onto the plate, you know, encouraging people to eat more vegetables in more ways is, is something we should all really be um, championing. And that's uh, definitely what we're doing here at Potatoes USA is getting everybody to eat more potatoes in more ways. Um, so what we've got for you all, we sent you all some really wonderful gifts. Um, in that gift bag, uh, we've got some dehydrated potatoes. And what our challenge is for all of you is to hopefully build your own bowl that's inspired by your own concept or your own organization, right? So if you wanna take that bowl of mashed potatoes, make something with it and put on some interesting toppings, just all we ask is take a, take a nice photo of it, flip it to Kendra and myself. And what this is gonna do is just help drive inspiration throughout the industry, right? We've got lots of great ideas in the audience. We wanna see those ideas. We wanna see what type of talent uh, you can showcase with your ingredients using potatoes in different ways. So we just thought that would be a fun little activity and exercise for everybody to be a part of. Awesome, RJ, thank you.
Kevin, I did have one more little shout out, which is what is what everyone um, should be received or will be receiving um, was just our potato university. And that's just one more way for everyone to learn about uh, potatoes. And um, it's kind of our our pride and joy. And so we hope everyone takes the time to look and uh, get their uh, baccalaureate in potatoes, if you will. <laughs> so I love it. That's Kendra, it. Kendra, the other thing you might tell them too is, I know we're part of your running, you know, uh, uh, club that you have. That uh, yeah. I've got my own mask too that I can uh, I can I can share with everybody. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing. So tell them a little bit about it because if you run, you get T-shirts and gifts and all that. So we have a lot of runners that are part of our organization. So if you if you love potato swag, you're in luck. And um, it's not just running, it's pretty biking, um, it could be swimming, all sorts of activities, but Team Potato, naturally that's the name for it, um, is something that you can join online and it's a way to, it's a community of people who are fueling with potatoes. So as RJ mentioned with the vitamin C, potatoes are an excellent source of vitamin C, but they also have a lot more nutrients that you can fuel with and so, it's a great way that athletes can use to fuel with potatoes. And so there's ways that you can engage and go on everyone posting of like doing 10 mile runs and then eating potatoes. And so if you need more potatoes in your feed and would like to share with a bunch of people who feel the same way, definitely recommend joining. Um, just go to teampotato.com. Um, of course, we're all members and uh, would love to see you on uh, that page as well. And you get tons of team potatoes team potato swag as well. So we always give yeah. out sweatshirts and jerseys and hoodies and stuff like that. So definitely go and join it. Yep. Well, Kendra and RJ, that's great. Stay with us too, because we get to the Q&A, we'll uh, bring you guys back in, but we're gonna go over to Shane right now. So um, Shane, thanks for being with us. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to hearing about your life and what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Kevin. And uh, I'll I'll give RJ a plug. I know he just walked off. I don't know if he can still hear me or not. I will give him a plug. If you want to get excited about potatoes, follow him on Instagram, man. No joke. It's been a long year, but uh, seeing a lot of those things that you've been posting lately really are are phenomenal. So just want to give you a, a little shout out there. <laughs> That's great. And Sh Shane, in your introduction, which I did earlier, of course, thanks for joining us again. I told everybody about you know, the, how busy you are right now for the new <laughs> prototype opening this weekend. So really appreciate you being with us today. Uh, explain a little bit about First Watch and uh, what you're doing, but looking forward to hearing an update on everything that's happening in your world. So uh, you're on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, and and I, although, yeah, I didn't hear the the introduction, I'm sure it was it was perfect. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a long road for us, for sure. Um, like like all of you guys listening and and uh, my peers in the industry. Um, but I think, you know, like most brands, we're starting to see that that uh, upswing. And it's certainly, you know, positive reinforcement, not only for our teams, but for us here at the corporate office. And I would say like mid to, to fall of last year, we, we made a conscious decision to kind of split our, our focus. And, and those of us here at the office who are dedicated to uh, the four walls of the restaurant and HR and our people focused very heavily on making sure that that kind of train was going to continue to run and that we were addressing all of the challenges that, that we were seeing within the four walls. But those of us who have a focus on strategy and, and kind of future programs um, broke off a little bit, not saying we didn't pay attention to what was going on the four walls, but we broke off a little bit and really started to think about, okay, what happens when this is over? And for us, you know, what happens when this is over had a lot to do with the way we were building out our restaurants um, and also our menu. Um, we've been working for about three years on a, a core menu evolution project, which has been awesome and, and is truly about um, evolving our brand once again. Um, you know, we've been around for, for 37, 38 years. And, you know, we look at our menu today and say, hey, it's not broken, but how can we be better? And maybe that's better ingredients or improvements in consistency and quality. Um, or at the end of the day, just a more contemporary way to present um, healthy food. And uh, and you'll see a lot of that kind of kind of shine through. So um, I'll address the, the, the prototypes and the openings first. Um, the build outs of our restaurant. So as you mentioned, uh, Winter Park, which you told me is, is less than a half mile down the road from your house. You can walk to it. Um, we're going to be opening a new restaurant there on uh, on Monday, um, March 1st, which 
we're super, super proud of. Like if you had a dream um, first watch, this would be the one, right? It's a, a very large um, footprint, so larger than we normally go. It features an indoor outdoor bar, uh, a really nice patio, um, also a, a second cook line to try and address uh, all of the off-premise business that that we have and that really everyone who's on this call is is learning from and dealing with right now. But um, so a second cook line is is the first time we've ever done that in our history. Um, obviously that comes with it, its own set of, of challenges, but we're super excited to, to tackle it. I, I got a chance to tour, uh, the two Fridays ago and it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's really, really impressive and I'm excited to see how the operations teams kind of takes this tool and runs with it. So, uh, we also have a, a to go room. So on the walk up to the restaurant, to the front door from the parking lot, uh, we built out a separate little area, um, uh, where drivers and customers can come in and just pick up thus reducing the congestion kind of at the front of the house, or, or if you've ever been to a first watch, um, you know, that host stand um, can get a little bit hairy. So um, we've, we've, you know, by all accounts fixed said issue and, uh, and we'll be detouring drivers and, and customers who are picking up off premise food um, to a whole separate area of the restaurant. So, you know, I, as we were thinking about and designing it, you know, I think back to the, the Chili's um, and, and outbacks of the world who, who, who uh, had the foresight to do this, hell, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe 20, 20 years ago, something yeah. like that. And at that point in time, I remember thinking like, these guys are going to give up that four top on a Saturday, Sunday, or, or two four tops for the business just to make a pickup door. And, uh, it, you know, now being in the business this long, it, it certainly makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Shane, I've got a question for you in that. Yeah. So um, can, if you can speak of it, I don't know what you can say, but like the mix, what your ex expectation of the mix with this separate kitchen when it comes to catering versus third party versus pickup? Um, what do you think it'll be? So, you know, we, we anticipate our off-premise mix to stay right in the 20% to 30% range. Um, Pre-COVID, it was six to seven. So, um, you know, if you would have thrown those numbers out back then, <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't be invited to any more meetings, but, um, but yeah, so if we can see a, a 20 to 30%, um, overall mix of our, of our sales coming from off premise, you know, that that's fantastic, but it, it's not so much about the percentage mix as it is, you know, overall dollars. Like the idea is that we will free up the regular kitchen to handle, um, a much better throughput in that, in that dining area. And we have to in winter park because that restaurant's really large. So it's more square footage, more seats than we usually do, plus the indoor, outdoor bar and patio. Um, so we, if we were going to put that um, pressure on the kitchen, we need a way to alleviate some of it. And, and that, you know, there was born the, the second cook line, which I mean, look, we did we didn't invent this idea. There's plenty of concepts out there that that have to make lines and turn them on for uh, for high volumes. Um, but for us, it's a, a very new approach and uh, and something we're all really excited about. So we have Winter Park. Then we have our first restaurant in Chicago called, uh, it's in Oak Brook. Um, that's going to open in the next couple of weeks here as well. And then another one in Chicago called Kildeer, which is going to mirror uh, the Winter Park approach with the two make lines and, and uh, off-premise room and, and beautiful bar and patio as well. So um, a lot of new and exciting things on the construction and design front. Uh, obviously, you know, really happy to see how those restaurants turn out and, and, and learn from the teams. Like, uh, you know, I, those of you who know me know that I love being out there and, and spending time with those teams. Like I want to, I want to experience it. I want to see what they're going through on a daily basis so that we can make adjustments as needed and, and hopefully build really, really great restaurants for 2022 and beyond. Yeah. And in that, you know, what's kind of interesting too, is that, you know, in this almost year we've had, you know, in COVID, um, yeah. I know it's been on the fly. You've had to do a lot of different things and especially increasing your, you know, <laughs> off-premise to that percentage. Um, are there things that you're not offering off premise or are you pretty much still saying if you want it, we'll get it for you? So, yeah. So Benedict's are the only things we don't offer for off premise. Yeah. Um, and we get that question a lot on social media. Uh, and our answer is always the same. Look, it's a quality thing for us. Um, to begin with poached eggs don't travel really well. Um, it's one thing if you're picking it up and maybe eating in your car in the parking lot or driving right back to your house, but, you know, with an average delivery time at 30 minutes, sometimes 45, um, your, your poached eggs are not going to have that, that beautiful runny yolk everybody wants. And, uh, and they spill, right? So it's a, it becomes kind of a sloppy dish. 
And we've made a really, um, we stress the, the importance to all of our teams of plating every to-go dish just like you would in the restaurant so that it is stacked up, uh, it's beautiful looking, it has all of the garnishes and all the colors and everything you would expect from a plate at first watch. So that, that experience is, is as close to the in-dining uh, dine in experience as possible. And, you know, er, early on it was, Hey, how do you, how do we put a smile in that bag? And we talked about that a lot of like, put yourself in the shoes of the customer. They no longer have a server to, to, to interact with or a manager welcoming them, opening the door, smiling at them. And so how do we get that into the, the bag? And it always came back to the food. Like, look, this is our, our chance to showcase who we are. And, um, you know, I took a lot of that to heart and I know that the teams did as well. So we've stressed the importance of of making every single dish, whether it's in a box or on a plate, look exactly the same. That's awesome. And I know you've got some new uh, new menu coming out as well. And uh, I mean, did, how long did it take? And you know, <laughs> what did, how many items did you start with, and what did you end with? <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a it's been a pretty a pretty long road. So we started talking about this project in 2017 and then put pen to paper in 2018. And all of that was like coming to a head and ready to launch in 2020. Uh, as with most of our plans in, in life, uh, everything was put on pause, right? But uh, again, kind of that same time period I spoke about earlier, as we got to like summer, early fall, um, those of us that had projects like that on the table for strategy pivoted and, and, and said, hey, Let's get this stuff ready so that we have all these levers to, to turn on. Um, you know, one of those was these these prototypes and these build outs. Another one uh, was alcohol. Um, you know, last year we, we we rolled out alcohol in 140 of our restaurants across the country. And that's like soup to nuts. I manage that project too, right? So acquiring liquor licenses, uh, securing products, securing equipment, training all of our teams, Um it was crazy, but we did it and, and we've got about 100 and 120 um, left to do this year. So uh, those are all the levers that, that we kind of talked about as a team, like, let's be ready to pull all of these once we, we we come out or we're nearing the end of, of COVID instead of waiting and then starting all of our work on it. And then, you know, six, nine, 12 months later, being able to launch something. So we were we were poised and, and ready. And yeah, the new menu is it's uh, it's something I'm really proud of. I think anytime you work on a project for three years. Um, it has a very special place in your heart, but, you know, uh, a little bit of it is about um, consolidation. So, you know, there, there are less menu items that, that certainly was not the main goal, but it turned out to be that way when we started digging deeper and saying, Hey, how can we simplify operations, uh, improve quality and consistency across the board, and then create items that are going to um, travel well for off-premise. That was one of the goals, be you know, pre-COVID. Um, it obviously has a much bigger magnifying glass on it um, today, but that was that was certainly one of the things that we were thinking of and talking about. And really just looking around and saying like, what's on trend? Like it, you know, is there a different approach to eating healthy in, in 2021 and beyond? And, and we feel like there certainly is. Um, we've lean, leaned in on some of our past LTO items, which, um, you know, we have a pretty robust LTO program and, and uh, I smile because it's it's where we get to have the most fun, right? We play, uh, we test things, we try things. And, and you know, the feedback I keep getting from, from my peers in the industry is we're doing things that, uh, quote unquote, chain restaurants don't normally do. And, and I love that. Like, I think that's that's fun and I take great pride in that. So you'll see some things on this new menu that... Uh, <laughs> that you normally wouldn't see a, a, with, with a restaurant of our size. But I have all the faith in the world in our teams. We actually had our launch meeting uh, yesterday. Um, so I'm really excited to, to see two pilot restaurants launch with this new menu in the next month. That's awesome. I love what you said, too, about the uh, alcohol sales. So obviously, you probably have to have stores somewhere where it's a real big challenge or you can't even have alcohol, I would assume, in some of the southern states. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're we're getting we're getting there. We'll get sorry, we'll get into those guys. Um, we took all the low hanging fruit last year, right? So these were easy restaurants, um, mostly in Florida. Uh, those of you who, who don't uh, have the pleasure of living down here, you, you can kind of go to a Seven Eleven, get a liquor license, and start serving the next day. Um, where in other states, it, you know, you got to jump through some more hoops, and uh, and there's a significant cost associated with it. So. We took all that low-hanging fruit first early on 2020, roll it out, make sure the program works all good. Uh, and now it'll be turning really a lot of discussions with our landlords and, and, 
and as you mentioned, like cost and time, these these will be more difficult than than the last years were. Yeah. Um, so are you know, are, are you going to do anything that's uh, going to be regional at all in this menu or even in the beverage menu? Are you going to try to incorporate products that, um, you know, would, would, would showcase, you know, from the, from the region, something that's really special? Yeah. You know, we, we've talked a lot about regionality and, and um, with our size and our makeup of, of corporate and franchise um, restaurants, like we want to keep this menu as consistent as we possibly can. It helps us in, in our buying power, you know, you can you can uh, you can find pros and cons to both approaches, but when we look at our our splits on LTOs, um, the range or the difference between uh, region, there isn't that huge of a difference. Um, you, you'll see certain things: uh, tacos and burritos sell more in, in in you know the Southwest, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, and then crab or seafood heavy dishes tend to do really well up in the Northeast. But aside from that, there's not too much regional fluctuation. And we want to really kind of keep that as streamlined as possible. There's a lot of benefits to, to keeping everything um, all on the same page, uh, no pun intended, but from a supply chain standpoint, obviously, uh, you know, you have greater buying power, the more restaurants you have on board. And for us, we really want every time you go to a first watch to be the same exact experience. So consistency is really big. Um, obviously, with, with many of our restaurants here in Florida, a hundred of our 400 plus restaurants here in, in the state of Florida, we have a lot of snowbirds, right? And so when they go home or, or back up north to, to Ohio or to Michigan or to the Northeast, we want to make sure that they're having the same experience that they're, that they're having when they're down here in the restaurants in Florida. So um, at one point we did have a number of different regional things, but they, they kind of tended to die off a little bit when we did our last menu, menu change and evolution. And, you know, we embrace some of them like biscuits and gravy. We're only in certain restaurants like, Hey, why can't, you know, people in New Jersey have biscuits and gravy. So we actually implemented some of those regional uh, differences to the entire company and, and that uh, served us really well. So uh, we're going to stay on that path as, as a strategy for at least a year or two now. Well, you know, I never like bringing up negatives, but, uh, we brought up the Northeast and I just have to, you know, bring up our conversation we had recently about the, yeah. the weather and what has done and what's happened in this year. I'll, I'll add something to that. I I'm still have family that live in Pennsylvania. I grew up outside of Pittsburgh and I talked to my cousin yesterday and he said, he said, this is the first time he could remember. And he's exactly my age. He's the first time he could remember that since Christmas until now, which is really unusual. He hasn't seen the grass in the yard. That's yeah. Much that had. So yeah, talk to us a little bit about that and your challenges. With it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been tough everywhere. Um, you know, take off the table that, it, that it's, you know, still a COVID year effectively. Um, and just, you know, if this were even a normal year of business, we have weather challenges all the time, right. With, with our spread of restaurants in Michigan, and Ohio and the Northeast, the, but the Northeast and, and, and Michigan, Ohio aren't, necessarily the ones we get the most concerned with, right? They know how to handle wood, uh, um, bad weather uh, from a local municipality standpoint, right? They have the equipment, they can, they can do it, they're used to it. And we'll, we'll accept that some, some days we're gonna lose to, to snow out, you know, whiteouts or snow um, storms. But really what we struggle with and, and like most of us are struggling with now is, is the Texas of the world, you know, the, the Georgias, the Tennessees, you know, these places are not used to storms like we had last week and um, it effectively completely shut down the supply chain. And, and it was extremely difficult to get our employees to work, one, two, to get product in from our distributors and our local produce companies. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I know that everyone else on here is, is struggling with the same exact thing. So, you know, I, I think the, the biggest lesson that we've learned in all this, specifically last week, you know, those long term relationships that you have with your supplier partners, with your distributors, with your local produce companies, um, you know, they, they really tend to come in handy uh, when situations like this arise. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to, to work for a company that sees value in those long-term relationships. And, and uh, you know, they, they certainly paid off. And, and when you get put to the front of the line or you get that first delivery or your priority on, on someone's spreadsheet, you know, that's a big deal for our teams and and frankly for the customers in those areas like they they want to go out they need food obviously and and it's important that our teams are able to support that that's awesome that's really cool to hear so yeah any uh final comment and i don't, don't go away if you have to go to you can but 
Uh, we're going to go to Marie in, in a second, but a final comment you want to share with the group? No, I'm not going anywhere. I want to hear what Marie has to say. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm good. I, you know, I, I miss everybody a lot and I, I see all the, the chat and the, the, the comments going back and forth here. You know, it's crazy to think we all used to spend a ton of time together on the road in different cities. And, you know, people ask me all the time, what do you miss most? Like I, I miss eating food in other cities the most. That's <laughs> plain and simple, you know? Yep, so hopefully exactly. it'll happen soon, but I, I appreciate you having me on and, and everybody t- t- tuning in and listening. So appreciate Thank it. You. Hang, hang in for the Q and a, and I'm with you on that too. It's <laughs> like, we can't wait. Susan, especially she's like, she can't wait to start <laughs> traveling. We can't wait to start running our events. So, uh, so Marie, we're going to come over to you. I'll uh, let me get you on here. And I am so happy to be here. I always feel like I luck out when I get to be involved in things with ICCA. So thank you for the time. Um, I've put together just a couple slides to really kind of bring together the, the content from today supported with trends. Uh, so what I first wanted to mention is, you know, RJ showed us a great, you know, global potato dish and I know it's no surprise to any of us that global is really a normal cuisine these days. So we all know that Gen Z is the most ethnically diverse generation yet and bringing um, lots of global taste preferences with them. So over half of us have gone out of our way to try global flavors and 46%, so almost one in two consumers, have eaten a global dish within the past two weeks. And I would uh, wage a guess that I think this has only increased during the pandemic as consumers have gotten tired of certain foods that they're eating and they're increasing their uh, portfolio of foods and dishes while we're all spending more time at home. Uh, So I think most of you on the uh, line with us are familiar with our menu adoption cycle, and I wanted to share the different global cuisine types that are falling in the uh, menu adoption cycle trend curve. And what I wanted to specifically highlight is uh, if you look there in the adoption stage in red, which is what we call the uh, innovation engine for food service, really when Uh, ingredients or cuisines have cleared that initial hurdle of being maybe too scary or edgy or niche, but they're still exciting and driving excitement. Uh, Korean cuisine is right there. So uh, like the bulgogi RJ shared with us, uh, Korean is gaining ground, continues to, uh, along with things like, let's see, Middle Eastern cuisine and Oaxacan cuisine and Hawaiian cuisine, all are playing in that adoption stage today. And a couple trending ingredients from uh, Asian cuisines, Korean included, uh, gochujang, which we've been talking about for a while now, is really like the next sriracha, continues to trend. It's the fastest growing type of Asian flavor on menus. Uh, Also, furikake, the Japanese seasoning, continues to trend. And then sriracha aioli as well. So sriracha hasn't gone anywhere. And aioli or sriracha aioli is, uh, you know, not just, say, a sandwich spread. Uh, We see this on sushi and poke and even salads and all different types of menu applications. And then within that adoption stage of the trend curve, we also see a a few different Latin cuisines. So I wanted to highlight uh, trending flavors and ingredients within Latin cuisine as well. Um, Tajin happens to be one of the top trending brand names on menus. So really that gold standard for the chili lime uh, essence or flavor on menus. Um, Chipotle aioli continues to trend, chimichurri, Uh, salsa roja, and some hotter peppers like habanero. So you might notice as we look through those trending flavors for Asian cuisine and Latin cuisine that spicy is very prevalent. And if you think about it, you know, spicy really is synonymous with global cuisine in a lot of ways. And what I think is interesting, especially lately, because I've been working with a food psychologist at Data Central, Dr. Paul Rosin, and he's done a lot of work about how we develop our flavor preferences. So we know that we're born with some innate flavor preferences. We all are born liking sweet flavors. We're also all born not 
liking spicy flavors. So you really have to develop that taste. And if any of us remember when we first tried spicy, like, you know, probably didn't like it, but continue to try it. And Dr. Rosin actually calls our desire for spicy benign masochism, because it's almost like we all kind of get enjoyment out of like hurting ourselves in a way. Uh, so among the general population, most of us do prefer a moderate spice level. So if you add up those percentages at the bottom there of people who like mild or balanced or moderate spiciness, that's about 65% of us, uh, whereas 18% don't like spicy at all. And that is higher among boomers. And 16% of the population says the spicier, the better, and that's higher among younger consumers, Gen Z and millennials. When we think about where spicy has come, uh, used to mean jalapenos, maybe a generic hot sauce, maybe a buffalo sauce. Today, we're really seeing spicy manifest with things like Calabrian chili peppers. So chain restaurants are using Calabrian chili. I think I saw it most recently on Mod Pizza's menu. Uh, if anyone shops at uh, Trader Joe's, I think they have a new like boast pepper chili crisp that I'm personally kind of curious to try. And I'll echo, I think it was Shane who mentioned RJ's Instagram. I also recommend to follow and I've seen RJ make a homemade chili crisp. Um, so that's another type of new trending uh, spicy ingredient. Uh, so rounding out the, the top, trending flavors and sauces on menus. Here's the list and, and Kevin and the team have this deck in case you wanna refer back to this. Uh, but you can see a number of, of global flavors, again, gochujang and sriracha and agrodolce, and also some healthy, like better for you items like almond butter and green goddess dressing. And we know that there's always a built-in crop of consumers who are looking to make healthier choices. And especially now, as we move through and past the pandemic, more of us are looking to make uh, healthier choices and live a healthier lifestyle. So we're seeing more of these kind of healthful ingredients also friend. So I think RJ and, and uh, Kendra mentioned this and I'd love to echo it that when we think about potatoes, they are the number one most loved vegetable among Americans. And they are such an amazing blank canvas for these global flavors. So Kendra mentioned the growth of loaded fries, for example, um, they, they continue to grow on menus even though they're highly penetrated right now. And they are popular with some key audiences, millennials in particular have high affinity for loaded fries. And uh, looking into what types of loaded fries are trending, we see a couple core themes. So a healthy halo, things like gluten-free callouts or vegetarian or vegan callouts, um, Mexican flavors like queso or pico or cilantro, um, American comfort food. We know in the pandemic, we're looking for comfort. So different mayos or barbecue flavors or cheese sauces. And then also the notion of making loaded fries more upscale with truffle flavors or Parmesan garlic or different types of herbs. And uh, talking about breakfast as well. So breakfast across the industry is growing. More operators are adding breakfast. Uh, if, if we compare to the past four years, that number is trending upward. And a couple dishes within the breakfast category are experiencing uh, particular growth. So shakshuka is one of those. Breakfast bowl is one of those. And breakfast burger, too. All have triple or double digit growth on restaurant menus. And I thought this example down at the bottom here was cool. A uh, breakfast burger that includes crispy tater tots in the build. So sort of kind of a play on adding potato chips to a sandwich, um, adding tater tots to a burger. So uh, here we're looking at the top. So the most common items on breakfast menus. And if you look at the veggies and fruits column, you can see potato is, is very high up there. So potatoes are found already today on about 64% of breakfast menus. And I have a couple examples coming up in a bit of really great applications for potatoes at breakfast. 
Uh, key trends within the breakfast category. So better for you is one right now. Again, we're more of us are trying to be healthy. So we're looking for healthful super fruits and colorful produce items like acai or roasted beets. Those items are popping up on breakfast menus. Uh, global ingredients as well are trending at breakfast. So everything from like that citrusy uh, tang of yuzu to tahinis, nuttiness, to the spiciness of harissa, uh, all are trending on breakfast menus. And then lastly, the notion of kind of premium ingredients or premium upgrades to breakfast. So maybe it used to be like a cheddar cheese and now we're seeing artisan cheese and grana padano. Uh, or maybe, you know, it used to be a uh, generic aioli and now we're seeing garlic aiolis and different balsamic glazes and sort of upscale sauces on breakfast menus. So I mentioned some top performing breakfast dishes. Here's a couple of them from the past year or so. I think this omelet is a great example of doing like a premium protein upgrade to an omelet. It has a uh, ribeye steak uh, folded in there. Uh, this meat lovers breakfast bowl uses home fries as the base. And then we know there's always a, a group of people interested in sweet breakfast too. So lots of kind of sweet indulgent options are also scoring and performing well with consumers, cinnamon rolls and bread puddings and bananas foster. And then here are a couple examples of high performing breakfast side items. So you'll notice here that potatoes are again a star. Uh, Brugger's has done a, a twice baked hash brown. You can kind of read this as the more red that you see in that chart, the better the item performs. So uh, that twice baked hash brown performed tremendously uh, along with that loaded hash brown casserole, uh, some sweet blueberry pancake bites, and then also a couple bacon options. So we know bacon is always a sort of secret ingredient that will help increase concept appeal. So a chicken fried bacon and a snacking bacon available from Duncan both performed great as recent breakfast side launches. Uh, so to wrap things up, just like bacon, uh, we can val uh, use our concept testing database to validate some of those secret ingredients that can really boost uh, purchase intent in, in menu development. And potatoes are really uh, something that does that very well. So overall, in concepts in our database that don't include potatoes, uh, score a 46% in purchase intent, and those with potatoes score 49%, so 3% point increase if a dish has potatoes in it. This is also true if we look across breakfast dishes, we see a 3% increase. It's also true if we look across breakfast sandwiches, another three percentage point increase. And then lastly, and this is similar to RJ's bulgogi dish today, uh, when we look at specialty entree category on menus, the average purchase intent of a dish without potatoes is 43% and with potatoes, uh, if I can do math right now, a 6% increase uh, in purchase intent for the overall dish. Thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, I've got a question for you too. I know it was mentioned a little bit in there, but you know, like turkey bacon, chicken sausage, and even plant-based proteins, uh, where are they showing up? I know they weren't on the top parts of those charts, but are you seeing decent increase in those? Yeah, it's funny, Kevin. One thing I did earlier today was a panel for the Smart Brief conference that's going on, and it was about plant-based uh, options. And someone uh, from White Castle said that they're um, noticing plant-based options increase at breakfast specifically, and we can echo that with our data. We see uh, breakfast, plant-based breakfast sausages and also plant-based eggs growing on breakfast menus right now. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does. Do you guys have any questions uh, for Marie about the statistics and trend information that you saw? I, I don't have questions. It's, it's awesome to see. I, I love seeing you guys uh, present. And, you know, for us, a lot of those things, uh, I get excited. I smile uh, <laughs> to myself because, look, we're, we're testing that. We, you know, we rolled that last year and, and we're really pushing hard. Like, 
it's validation for what we've seen, you know, in our own travels, but yeah. also it, it lines right up with what our customers are supporting, you know, with their wallets, um, which, which items do better from a mix standpoint. So um, it's great. Uh, you know, I do have a little envy. We, we don't have uh, fryers or heat lamps or microwaves at first watch. So um, every time I see a potato presentation, I just imagine what the world could be like. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Shane, yeah. what do you find with your customers when it comes to spicy levels? Are they like heat seekers or more modern yeah. spice? I mean, it varies so much. You know, we have we have over 400 restaurants. So there's a there's a massive spread there. But, um, you know, when we run LTOs, we have to be very careful to how we call things out. Right. And sometimes you, you have to just dumb it down and, and let them know this is this is a, a spicy red sauce. Don't call it Harissa because they're not going to know they're going to order it and then they're you know, they're going to they're going to try and send it back. So um, we've learned our lesson with a few LTOs over the years. Um, you know, Shakshuka, we rolled Shakshuka three years ago and it, it, it tested. OK, everyone who ordered it loved it. When we rolled it nationwide, we changed it to Mediterranean baked eggs and it like doubled in mix. Hmm. So sometimes you, you just have to be aware, um, you know, stay true to the dish. I, I always try and do that as much as we possibly can. But I think in the naming convention conventions, you know, your point was well taken, like, you know, calling tahini chili lime. I, I love tahini. My daughter's six. She loves tahini. Uh, what's on everything. That's how she, we can get her to eat any food. Um, but, you know, when you when you try and put those things out there, it, sometimes the term chili lime is just more widely accepted and understood. Yeah, Totally. That's really cool. So uh, Kendra and RJ, I got a question for you. It's like, you know, you obviously are getting requests from all over the place, right? From the individual restaurant to chains and to non-commercial. Um, how do you process that? Is it, a, you know, is it a, a systematic process or are there a lot of people involved in the process? How do you do it? Not this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're always willing and ready to work with different operators and we get contacted all the time about doing innovation sessions. Um, and quite honestly, the way it operates is it's really just me and Kendra having a phone call with each other and processing it that way and seeing how we can prioritize it. Um, you know, Potatoes USA, we're still a relatively small organization, uh, although we do represent more than 2,500 growers. Um, and so it, it works out well the way that we just collaborate and make things happen. But, you know, it's a, it's a call to action for anybody that's uh, a member of ICCA. If you want to work with us or it's absolutely free of charge, we just start ideating and, and try to match potato ideas with your brand. And it's not even just the ideation too. We'll work with Data Central to even help do um, trends research that can uh, make sure that the item that we're presenting is actually going to fit onto the menu and what consumers want. So there's kind of a lot of different pieces um, with the ideation section um, that go with it. That's great. So basically, we're at, we're at the end of it, and we're going to show a video that we always close out with. But um, for that, I'll just um, I'll, I'll throw out if there's anybody else that has a comment they would like to uh, to end with and uh, and close us out. I'm good. It was good to see everybody, honestly, and and, and hear everyone's voices since we can't be uh, be together in person. So I'm looking forward to that day where we're in another city and and eating food and having some drinks together. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, echo that. It's uh, it's going to be great when we all get to dine at, dine with each other once again. Um, one thing I didn't mention, if you guys want recipes that we featured here today, they're all accessible on potatogoodness.com. So you can go there and check out like the bulgogi recipe or the General Tao's, chicken, uh, General Tao's potato recipe we were talking about earlier. Um, so yeah, all those are on our website. Thank you. I was going to say, I want to try those recipes. And I saw the air fryer one pass through on the chat. So that's going to be my next move. And it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Thank you for the chance to uh, talk with you today. Yeah, thanks to all of you. And so everybody knows, too, that uh, we'll have this video up on Friday. And we'll also have both of the PowerPoint presentations that everybody can have. And anything like that that anybody needs, of course, you just send an email to uh, our headquarters and we'll be able to handle that for you. Uh, we'll be back in two more weeks with our with our next one in the same series. And I'd be remiss not to do a shout out for other uh, potato partner that we have, uh, Idaho Potato Commission, who I know works very well with Potatoes USA as a big partner uh, together. And, you know, for uh, Alan and Jamie, it's like, you know, they, they have been with us since day one and uh, in uh, our associations. And we're so happy to have Potatoes USA with us, too. You guys have been with us now for several years. And we really appreciate the partnerships. And we know how important potatoes are to our industry. 
So again, thank you to everyone. Thanks to all of our members and sponsors who are with us today as well. And we'll go to Mike and uh, and close this out with our uh, with our video.